Welcome to a special series of Beyond the Text, The Interviews. I'm your host, Samuel Woodall, and in this podcast series, we'll embark on a captivating exploration of ideas in intellectual history and political thought, through in-depth conversations with former colleagues, esteemed academics, and influential public figures. Whether you're an academic, a history enthusiast, or simply curious about the world of ideas, each episode provides a unique opportunity to engage with brilliant minds who have left an indelible mark on our intellectual landscape. Join me as we journey through intellectual history and political thought, guided by the insights of my guests. Welcome to another episode of Beyond the Text, The Interviews. Today, we are honoured to have Professor Anthony Pagden joining us to delve into his extensive work on the Enlightenment and its enduring relevance in contemporary society. Professor Pagden's academic journey has taken him across continents from Santiago, Chile, to London, Barcelona and Oxford. Educated at the prestigious University of Oxford, he has held esteemed positions at institutions such as Merton College, the European University Institute in Florence, King's College, Cambridge and Johns Hopkins University. Currently, he serves as a distinguished professor of political science and history at the University of California, Los Angeles. Throughout his illustrious career, Professor Pagden has been deeply engaged in the intellectual history and political theory of empire, exploring how the West grappled with its dominance over vast parts of the world and the repercussions of its erosion. His scholarly interests extend to cosmopolitanism, nationalism, internationalism, the history of international law and the European Union. With more than a dozen books to his name, Professor Pagden is a prolific author whose works have been translated into multiple languages, his recent publications include The Enlightenment and White Still Matters, The Burdens of Empire, 1539 to the Present, and The Pursuit of Europe, A History. Beyond academia, Professor Pagden's insights have graced the pages of esteemed publications such as The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, The New Republic, and more. His expertise spans courses in the history of political thought, international relations theory, imperialism, and nationalism. Today, we have the privilege of delving into Professor Pagden's profound understanding of the Enlightenment and its enduring significance. So join us as we explore why the Enlightenment matters now more than ever. Welcome, Professor Anthony Pagden. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> um, and we'll go straight into the questions on the Enlightenment and why it still matters. Mm. In your book, you argue that the Enlightenment marked a departure from traditional religious frameworks toward a new understanding of humanity. How did this shift manifest in the philosophical and intellectual landscape of this time? It's a difficult question to answer. I mean, only in the fact that we're dealing with, of course, always a, a very small number of people, um, a very influential number of people, and um, very, the, each of them was very influential. Uh, and we're dealing with a phenomenon which is always eluded uh, clear definition. I think that's the first thing to mention, that there was a period in the 80s and 90s where there was a lot of debate about whether there's enlightenment at all, and uh, an insistence that enlightenment had a national framework and so on. Now, this it seems to me um, perfectly reasonable. I mean, people writing in English were different from those writing in Latin or from those writing in French or German and so on. They had different intellectual formations, different intellectual backgrounds. But one of the importance about the book I wanted to insist, I'll come to the religious question in a second, but one of the reasons I wanted to insist was that this actually was, as the contemporary German philosopher Jürgen Habermas insists, a project. And it was a project that was recognized by contemporaries as being a project. And, and so that, yes, they also recognized there was differences between peoples. Um, but there was no real national concern. There was no suggestion that, um, you know, a David Hume, who was a good friend of, a, a good friend of Didot and an enemy of Rousseau, so people became an enemy of Rousseau, um, was, saw himself as, as engaged in something entirely different. Um, there's also, as you may know, been a very influential series of books by Jonathan Israel, who tries to insist that the Enlightenment is nothing other than a legacy of of the of of Spinoza, Baruch Spinoza, and that there's there's um, there's an Enlightenment and a counter Enlightenment, so that the world must be divided into these two parts. They're very powerful books, very forcefully written, but I think they're entirely wrong because if you look at the figures on each side of this wall, you will find that often. Um, you'll find Condorcet and, and Hume, for instance, were good friends um, to the extent that Hume actually left Condorcet a large sum of money in his will. And these are, these are two people, according to 
Jonathan Israel's definitions, which should be on different sides of the of the of the of the fence. So there are, and I just quote this not to take a stab at Israel, but because, simply because there is this highly contentious. And what is this thing which you called enlightenment? So what I tried to do in the book was to actually, you know find an answer so to speak and therefore and hence the subtitle which incidentally was not mine that was my publisher's but it's been quite successful <laughs> um which was to say what is the enlightenment and um why does it matter and what manifestations as you put it in your question does it have now as far as the religious con concept is concerned this of course is is crucial to the whole understanding because of course what what all of these what this project was about was um in a sense, you put it in a nutshell, it comes down to, you know, it, what what this meant was one other thing. But what it, what it was about was what Kant said in 1784, you know, dare to know, superiority. Um, free yourself from your self-incured immaturity. Mankind has to think for itself. Or, and these claim meant that you had to, not that you had to abandon religion or you had to reject religious belief, but you had to reject the claim that those beliefs, that religious orders, the religious structure of the world would determine the way that you should think and act. So I think that's the, that is the important, uh, the important claim I was trying to make. So how it's manifest in the philosophical intellectual landscape, I'm not quite sure how to answer that question. I mean, this was uh, I'm not sure quite, quite what you're trying to get at, because but but I mean one way of answering this question, one way of interesting answering this question would of course be to say that this is a multifaceted project that it operates at very very many different levels. So we have the Kant at one end, who is straightforward, a moral philosophy, um, political philosophy, very very much legal philosophy, something that's often often forgotten about Kant. Uh, on the one hand, and then you have people like Voltaire, who you mentioned later on, uh, and so on, who are much more liter literary figures whose approach is via the theater, because Voltaire, don't forget, from his lifetime, is known largely as a playwright, via the theater, via poetry, uh, via the short essay, for instance, in the case of, of Hume. There are all kinds of ways in which this is manifest in the world. And um, you know, the, there's, so that's, that would be my answer to your question. As far as, as I say, the, the, there's no, there's, there is an attempt, certainly with people like Hume, to uh, sort of tear away un the, 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 the structure of the religious world, so to speak, um, to tear away its influence upon the decision-making process we might have. But there isn't an attempt really to undermine, as let us say, its cultural implications or indeed its... Um, it's moral implications. In many ways, you can think about, as many in the 19th century said, you know, that this is a, there's a, there's a, there's a form of, of secularized religion at the bottom mm. of this, or not secularized religion, because it's not religion, from it's Christianity, from it, a form of secularized Christianity. What is under attack all the time is, as it were, the, the paraply of, of, of myth that goes with it from everything from, of course, tr tr all of these phenomena which are inexplicable in, in scientific terms, as to say, the trinity, the transubstantiation, and so on and so forth, and the stories behind it. Um, that's the point of attack, someone like Voltaire, for instance. Um, and on the other hand, the um, and the claim, the claim made by the institutions, mainly the church is uh, so more than one of them, um, to, as it were, dictate the terms of one's daily life. So that would be the, the argument. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, um it's that's perfectly laid out as you were saying that sort of like idea of a secularized christianity in mozart's magic flute that it's a move from the temple of christ to the temple of reason that it's yeah yes, um, yes, it, yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, um you know one of one of the one of the targets of this book is alistair mcintyre um and uh for whom i should say obviously i have great respect but um and he makes of course the point about the the, the role of music in the enlightenment which mm. i've left out because that's also another aspect of it that um he doesn't prove the enlightenment of course but he sees it as being essentially one of the things slightly eccentric in, in, in the way that he manifests it but brilliantly eccentric but this is a form of um uh that music plays a crucial role so that 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 I mean, not that you're talking about music, talking about the plot, but I mean, nevertheless, it's certainly true that that is a is a crucial element. Centri in, in, centrifugal and, 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 
yeah. is, a, is a key, I mean, is a, in, when you think of him as a quintessentially, in a sense, enlightenment figure. Mm. And the same, yeah, the magic marriage of Figaro and the uh, yes. sort of class yes. dynamic there. Um, yeah. But another centrifugal thing in, 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 terms of, in terms of the establishment of enlightenment is religion. So could you elaborate on how the Reformation and subsequent challenges to religious authority contributed to the intellectual climate that gave rise to enlightenment ideas? Well, as I try to set out in the book, I don't think that the, the, the doctrinal elements of these two are not to the point. I mean, nobody was really interested in in, in the district. No one's really interested in the, transpercent, the debate over transubstantiation, for instance, or, the, or much between the distinction between grace and nature, although that that does come into occasion. The real impact of the Reformation uh, was was that it shattered the, the consensus that you, up until... The middle middle of the 16th century say you had a, uh, a a single church which provided a single authority that whatever you did within the terms of that authority that was the authority you could you could contest it or not but there was a single authority to which you could refer um what happens after that is that that goes so there are no there's no longer a single voice. christianity no longer speaks with a single voice and um, this is sig highly significant because it's not true of either of the other two monotheisms. There are, yes, I mean, you could say that Islam is divided into Sunni and Shia. That is true, but they're not, they're not, it's not quite the same fracture. Mm -hmm. um, neither of them says, you know, is, is setting out to, um, in a sense, completely reinterpret uh, the, what, what the religion itself might mean. There are variations, it's true, but it's not quite the same thing. There you have a, here you have a complete division and the authority of the church uh, disappears and at the same time and this is I mean it's different but it's related to it you have the discovery of America and that shatters in, in another sense the reliance which is closely related to the, the authority of the church on the ancient canon of basically Aristotle um, so you know you have this, this there's, a, there's a moment I always think of as a moment but when in which a, a Spanish a Jesuit is sailing to the uh, New World, and he sits on his the prow of the ship and says, "I, according to Aristotle, I should not be here." Um, <laughs> and so I thought of this, and then I laughed at all of Aristotle and all his works. Okay, mm. so this was the idea. So once this, and Erasmus makes a similar claim about, you know, why should I believe anything the ancients say when they knew nothing about the existence of America? So there's this idea that this is a challenge to the consensus. Now, of course, you know, this is these are exaggerated statements. It's like Locke's claim you should throw your books out of the window. Locke had a very extensive library, read extensively and so on. But the idea that you should dispense with, you know, the world that had the world that preceded you, which had, of course have been embedded in this in this canon of, of, of classical text. Um, and that was, you know, that was sapientia, that was knowledge. Um, these two that plus the uncertainty now. The lack of any authorial voice from the church meant that you were, as it were, on your own. <laughs> I mean, you could think of it in a world, a world which was fractured and a world which, of course, you know, the, the immediate response to this is is someone like Montaigne. It's it's skepticism. It's the skepticism. Of, you, know, you can you can go in different directions with skepticism. Montaigne ends up being, being highly conservative. But it's certainly whatever, whatever, whatever it does, it presents this is the important thing about skepticism. It's a challenge, you know. Mm. You know, skepticism is the challenge of Carneades after this Greek orator who came to Rome and preached um, Stoicism one day and Epicureanism the next, and everyone applauded on both occasions. So, I mean, you have this idea: what is the what is the answer to this challenge? And that was, in a sense, what you know, the whole of that generation of the 17th century, which goes under the heading of the. Uh, scientific revolution, another phenomenon which in my undergraduate days was under much attack, and I still think it's a valid conception. I think that, that I mean, they thought there was a scientific revolution, so um, who's to question what they thought? So that they th were aware of being involved in something which was turning the world upside down. And it's out of that, the skepticism is born of that, that the Enlightenment comes. It's also, of course, of that, the claim that what the Enlightenment is, is about the pursuit of science and reason. Yes, yeah, and, and progress, yeah, and yeah, to show, to simple, yeah. Mm. Um, and yeah, no, that that point about the Battle of Ancients and Moderns is obviously something that then carries through so prominently in Enlightenment um, thought. And you mentioned skepticism, 
as a guiding principle of enlightenment thinkers like Montaigne and Descartes, how did scepticism shape their views on the nature of humanity and its place in the world? Well, as I say, the the the, the, the first point about this is is, is scepticism offers you a challenge, doesn't offer you a solution. Um, and so you have to come up now. One of the chat, one of the ways of doing that is is the way that Montaigne himself responded, which is to say that you know I I can't believe in change because I've seen what damage it can do, as I have no certainty about anything in the world. Better to stick with what you have, what you what you have, than try and get to something else which may turn out to be much worse. So certainty, uncertainty can lead to revolution on the one hand and deep conservatism on the other. So, but I think what, what it's a challenge and what the, in what both the, the thinkers of the 17th century, if you think of this, you can think of the whole process of enlightenment begins in uh, roughly speaking, I suppose you, you, you talked of Montaigne as a member, an enlightenment thinker. I mean, it's not normally thought of that because our, our periodization is much more rigid, but in a way you're right because you can think of the whole process of it going from the middle of the world wars of religion in France, where you have this beginning of the collapse of the consensus mm -hmm. through to, you know, Hegel, really. Yeah. And the whole thing, yeah. let's say. Uh, so Montaigne. It's, yeah. Hegel. it's yeah. very so difficult would... to find yeah. bookends ever, particularly going back to your point yeah. earlier. That was essentially what the first chapter of my PhD writing last term was on. And the only, uh, you know, I think Norman Hampson puts it the best when he says he doesn't even see any uh, point in trying to tackle what what yeah. the dates of the enlightenment are because everyone comes at it with a slightly different one the only person yeah. i've spoken to who uh had a clear one was professor dominic Aquila, 1648 to 1848 but even that i think brings so many issues with it but <laughs> well, it's interesting you should choose you should choose a an international treaty on the one hand and a mm. period democratic revolution on the other. Mm. So I mean, that, that, I mean, I can see it's an interesting, it's an interesting bracketing <laughs> it's an interesting choice of dates. <laughs> but, um, but I think there are other ways of looking at it. You can see it as, mm. well. on the other hand, on the other hand, I wanted to make a, I did want to make a claim, if I may mm. say, I don't know, yes, cool. do it. Um, but uh, that the, that the, there is a distinction. And I think that the enlightenment, you can see the enlightenment as trying to, um, re-establish as it were so 1648 might be a nice day to re-establish not a not a political order in the world obviously but to re-establish some kind of um, intellectual philosophical order uh, as a response to what had happened in the previous generation so again you can see it as a response to the skeptical challenge but it's a different kind of response so if you look at it very very crudely um if you take somebody um like Hobbes as as say or Bacon as being central to this scientific revolution, you could take Descartes as well, but Descartes is about much more much more um, subtle about it than Hobbes is. Subtle Hobbes very good, very very straightforward, very well, um, un unrelentingly dogmatic about certain points. And one of them, of course, is that you know we we. Um, we really can't accept any kind of sociability. This is completely unacceptable. But it, there is no sociability in the world. Um, now, of course, you know, like everything that Hobbes has written or anybody, anybody has written, you can find passages which contradict this. But basically, forget what, in a sense, what he said, that's how he is, he is read. He, as Hume says, is an out and outright Epicurean. Or the only thing that counts is pleasure and pain. Now, I think that um, what you find is that, and therefore, what happens, and we're trying to argue in the book, is that the whole idea of innate sociability, the whole idea that human beings are sociable animals, all of that goes. <clears throat> and what then happens in the Enlightenment, and this is, again, where 1648 to 70 cent comes into play, um, is that um, we are, and it's ironic, of course, Leviathan is published um, in, in 51 but still we are coming we are we are seeing a return which in 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 my book i identify as beginning with Puffendorf, seeing a return to a more moderate version of what this might mean so yes you want to get rid of what hobbes called the schoolmen um you want to get rid of this whole tradition of antiquity this whole reliance upon antiquity and so on yes you want to get rid of the idea um that there is a single dominant set of religious beliefs in the world that have to be debated at all times and so on so 
you want to get rid of all that. Yes, you want to diminish at least the conception of sociability, but you don't want to take it quite so far that all you have in common with your fellow creatures is a desire to stay alive at any cost. Uh, and so you want to introduce something else and you want to make it a more subtle. So that in a way is what um, is, is what I see that one of the aspects of the Enlightenment is to try and claw back, you know, what someone like Shaftesbury, when he's he critic, criticizing Locke says, you know, basically that you, Locke, because Locke was his tutor, so he hadn't, didn't have a very good relationship with him. But so you have, you know, thrown out, he didn't say the baby with the bathwater, but that's that's the implication. You've thrown out everything. And in the process, you've left us, you know, you produce a image of humanity, which is too dire to, to contemplate. So what we've got to do is not go back to the sources, not go back to Aquinas and Aristotle and so on, but go back to some conception of innate sociability, but something that's not, which in a way, but not so reductive mm -hmm. as to think that it's just a desire for self-preservation, that it can be much more than that. And so you get this whole question of sympathy or empathy, as we would call it, which of course becomes the dominant features of, which is what I'm trying to argue is in a sense, the dominant feature of what becomes the Enlightenment. And, and how do you think that that's reconciled by Enlightenment thinkers in terms of that binary of, as you said, competitive survival versus social bonds? And yeah, if you talk about Puffendorf and yeah, that idea of natural law and uh, and that it's this kind of, yeah, essentially human thing to come together. How, how, how is that reconciled by these Enlightenment thinkers? Well, I say most of them because you come up to the yes, there is a human, there is a human sociability. I mean, and it is in the recognition of the other. Yeah. So that's the that is what I have. I don't have, you know, I'm not I'm not driven by some kind of law that's embedded in nature that tells me what I have to do from the clothes I have to wear to people I should marry and so on. And as the church would have maintained, as the as the Thomists maintained, right? That I'm driven by this in, innate set of ideas. Of course, my reason plays a role in interpreting those ideas, but basically I'm driven by these innate set of ideas which God has implanted in me, which allows me to interpret the natural world as it is. And it's a very complicated set of arguments, and of course it's often you know, dismissed, particularly by the jurists, as being a lot of, of nitpicking, essentially. What you're talking about is God's command. Um, so, But you, you, you dispose of that complicated epistemological structure that Thomists have put in place, and you reduce it to, as Hobbes reduced it to simple self-preservation, you reduce it to um, recognition. So I recognize you because you look like me, um, well, I'm more or less, I mean, you look like me in the sense that you obviously belong to a species that I belong to, um, and you therefore can be presumed to share, um, you know, the, a lot in common with me, and the, certainly the sort of basic things you might show with needs, love, um, hatred, um, all of these things. So I can I can emphasize with you. You know, the, there's, this, there's this passage in uh, in Smith's um, um, Theory of Moral Sentiments where, you know, the, 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 he talks about, which is a commonplace in, in that sense, and it's not a commonplace antiquity too, but he's re-elaborating re it, that you see my, he calls it my brother on the rack, you know, that you're not, um, when you see my brother on the rack, you don't feel anything in the physical sense, but you can project yourself into that experience because that person belongs to the same species as yourself. And and therefore that gives you a bond with that, however power fragile it might be. But that bond is absolutely vital for the survival of species. Now, Hobbes claimed that that doesn't exist. I mean, if you're seeing someone on the rack, he doesn't, of course, use this example, but if you were to see someone on the rack, what you would be saying is, oh, God, thank God that's not me, right? You know, <laughs> and nothing else. <laughs> you say there's a passage in De Kive where Hobbes says, you know, even if you think you're making friends with people, you're not actually making friends with them. What you're doing is trying to get the better of them to show <laughs> how much cleverer you are than they are. So, you know, if you were to see someone like you say, well, thank God that's not me and I can go away and I can spend the rest of my day drinking or something calmly because um, I don't have to worry that I'm not being tortured. Mm -hmm. Whereas in fact, Smith's claim is you wouldn't do that at all. You'd be extremely upset and extremely worried by it because you recognize, um, now it comes down at the end, of course, to, to um, the Hobbesian response to this would probably be to say, well, you know, you're just sent to 
in our sense of the word, not Smith's sense of the word, you're a sentimentalist. You know, you think this is the case. Actually, most people would really see it, but just just go away saying, thank God that's not me. Okay. But I think that's that's the argument. The argument is that there exists this thing which um, you know, and, and you find as I tried to argue the book, you find this in every single author you can think of. Um, what 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 Rousseau calls sympathy, you know, I mean, um, so what they call sympathy and what Rousseau calls pity, right, pitié. Pitié is the, because we start with this idea of pity, we start with this sentiment of feeling, you know, hurt in a sense. So it's a sense, you know, it has something in common with the Hobbesian claim in that we're starting with something that's essentially a negative passion, if you like, or a negative sentiment, right, the feeling of pity. Um, the feeling of which is doesn't involve an element of thank God that's not me, but it also involves an element of, of, of you know, by implication, something I could perhaps do something about this and I should do something about this if I can. And so that is the basis of my connection with that other person. Doesn't he, doesn't Rousseau in the discourse on inequality have a very similar anecdote to? Smith to do with I think a horse or something like that that it can't yes, pass right. another yeah. dead a horse without yes. uh, crying and yeah, yeah. that's right I mean all, all animals mm. feel this and then mm. Rousseau makes mm. and all animals feel this Smith does I mean Smith is, is is much more complicated than mm. that but yes Smith would agree I mean all animals feel this association around all animals have this speed what they call time species recognition okay so we recognize the species. But human beings go one step further because they have this cognitive apparatus which allows them to put myself in my brother's position that as if it were it. me but without actually suffering. So yeah. that's the, the that's the crucial step that takes us that step further. And on the point of cosmopolitanism, as you discuss in your book, um, it was central to the Enlightenment's understanding of humanity as a whole. How did Enlightenment thinkers conceptualize that idea of a shared human nature uh, that we've been talking about and the impulse towards the social life? Well, I mean, you can think about it, you extend that outwards. It, uh, it means that it carries with it an implication that we have some kind of um, you know, obligation towards our fellow beings and that we Above all, we have an obligation not to think of them as being divided up into artificial units for preservation. If you think of what, I mean, the, the, again, going back, Hobbes is sort of, for me, always the test of what, what they're talking against. Everyone, everyone is replying to Hobbes in some sense. You know? um, and, and particularly Descartes, which is, which is different from Leviathan in this respect, is much more emphatic about these things. Um, so the... the, the you know that so that there's this sense that you you can you you have to do something about it in in the sense that you have to make an effort to communicate with other beings, human beings. Now, what that leads to is this sense of you know that there must be some common common denominator we all share in common. I mean, you know, a common language, if you like, a common language of humanity that we can all speak. It takes different, different natural forms, but we can all speak this common language. We all can all understand each other at some level. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether we're, you know, Swedish or Chinese, we still have this capacity. We may not be able to literally understand each other, but we can understand each other quite human beings. So in that case, it makes nonsense to think of divisions between human beings into nations. And, and of course, this is, also, the period when, again, 1648 is an important day, um, when nation building in, is becoming important. So, if you take, if you look at the politics of the Enlightenment, what you're looking at precisely is a world where the nation state is beginning to uh, manifest itself in all its, um, uh, in many ways, you know, it's still it's still an international, larger international community than would it's going to be, say, in 1848. But it's um, is nevertheless a community which is beginning to be divided up into these these separate entities, these separate holes. Um, having, of course, in that sense, in one sense, that's also a replacement um, for, um, going back to what you're saying about religion earlier, a replacement for this idea of a unified Christianity. Mm. Because Bell the thing sorry, no. sorry, I didn't mean to, no, I was just going to say, um, which Bellamine, who Hobbes responds to yes. as well, has been arguing about in the preceding yes. century on that 
split between spiritual and temporal power and it's massively moving in that direction which he'd been trying to defend against <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So you have this concept of a unified Christianity which disappears, and with it, that disappears the idea of a, a, a possible, um, you know, single community of humanity based in Christ, so to speak, okay? Um, and that, uh, that Bellarmine vision, so to speak, disappears completely as a consequence of this corruption. So what you have is Eos Rigo Cubus Regio, which comes at me near the Treaty of Augsburg, but it still is emphasized and established as an international legal principle um, uh, in, in, in Westphalia. And then that then, you know, is in a way the kind of intellectual, spiritual, whatever you like to call it, um, manifestation of the new nation state. You can certainly see it that way for all the, for all the historical quibblings about the actual terms of the treaty. Um, I think they perhaps the consequent, the long-term consequences of that. So what you need then is something to replace that. If you think of all of this as a way of trying to um, to humanize, the, you could say the Enlightenment time to humanize this, this destructive project of the 17th century, trying to, in, so in a sense, trying to humanize the nation state, you might say. So what you can have is not that people, you know, cosmopolitan is not um, just a, I mean, well, put it this way, it's not a, as, as as they understood it, it's not a rejection of the the need. It's not as Rousseau tried to ca characterize it. You know, a preference for for Turks over your over your next door neighbor. It is a de desire to try and put you Turks and your next door neighbor on the same intellectual and moral footing. That's to say, um, you know, Smith has this passage about you know why should we care for the peoples of China? Well, we should care for the peoples of China because they belong to the same species as ourselves because they're part of this larger human, this larger cosmopolis to which we belong. Now, of course, as you know, there's the other the other way it's often been represented is precisely in the the terms that Scruton describes it, for instance, and 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 Rousseau describes it um, as being a a kind of oh, and someone like um, you know. Giuseppe Mazzini, for instance, as being really just a way of a sort of sloppy, fuzzy way of privileged people to say, you know, I don't, I don't need these, they don't need these attachments. First of all, because I'm rich enough not to care about them, you know, mm. the cosmopolitans, the people who meet in the front end of aircraft and airplanes, they're the business class, <laughs> right? First class, um, and the people who are in, stuck in the back in 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 uh, economy, they have to have this. Uh, sense of unity to keep them going hmm. and that that attitude seems that that claim which was you know is, is part of the part of the nationalist response to co cosmopolitanism um throughout the latter part of the 18th and early part of the 19th century is something that is 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 simply not what is intended here i mean what is intended here is not that you should not have a and this is why uh, the passage i quote which is which i like so much is is montesquieu's one Mm. about you know, I, if I and it's interesting it's always put in the negative you know if I were to do something that was offensive to my fa family I would despise myself if I were to do something which is offensive to my nation my patria I would reject it if I were to do something put interestingly Europe in here if I were to do something that was offensive to Europe I would be reprehensible if I were to do something offensive to humanity I would then so so you build up these it's just what i said these stoic circles right you start from the, the beginning and you move outwards but the point about the stoic circles is always that or at least montesquieu's interpretation of it, and this is i think generally true of the enlightenment is that it's that these it doesn't it, it's not that you move outwards leaving the others behind which is the sort of traditional scruton view several so scruton views of enlightenment right yeah. you these are all part of the story you have to care for your family. You have to care. And you put those first. If there's a conflict between your family and humanity, your family comes first. But you should never lose, lose sight of the ultimate rim, the ultimate circle, which is humanity. And that's what a cosmopolitan really is like. Mm. When yeah. Rousseau says to, sorry, when, when Didor says to Hume, you like me are a citizen of the world, it's it's a sort of general phrase, mean, doesn't really have this that implication, but the implication behind it is you are someone who is Scots, you know, yes, you speak French with a terrible Scottish accent, um, and but, but you are <laughs> someone who nevertheless, you know, has um, this sense of the world as a world of human beings united together. Uh, at some level, without at the same time losing track 
or site of your Scottishness. And, and on that point, your book highlights the, the the very diverse background and perspectives of Enlightenment thinkers. How did this diversity contribute to the development and exchange of ideas during this period? Well, I think, uh, as I'm trying to say, I mean, you know, if you think about you're dealing with different genres, you're dealing with people who, for the most part, are, of course, not professional university teachers. The only one who really fits into this category, I stand to be corrected, but... Um, was Hume never, never got a, never was never given a position is Kant. Kant is the only one who's a straightforward down the road university professor. Um, so none of them are Hobbesian schoolmen or their their heirs. Um, all of them, most of them, with a few honourable, you know, really striking exceptions like Condorcet, are not aristocrats either. So they're not self-funding. Um, so you know. And they come from, you know, mixed, as you know, very, very mixed backgrounds. So across the spectrum, all the way from Sweden through to, to Ireland, so to speak. Um, but, um, and they work in different genres all the time. So we mentioned this earlier, this idea of being, you know, poets and so on. This is a way that a, a movement that manifests itself out at very many different levels, because precisely if you're talking about things like uh, human sensibilities, um, um, sympathy, all of these terms that are so crucial to this idea of a unified human, a human psyche, so to speak, a human, uh, a human entity, a humanity, humanitas, seen as a, a single whole. All of that, you know, is something that can be played out at different levels, as you mentioned, music being one of them, or the opera anyway being one of them to sort of play music and, and the text together. The the idea that this is this is much more than just a philosophical uh, debate. So I think the diversity, in the sense, um, the true sense of the term, um, is uh, is something that is 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 again very unusual. Because if you look backwards, the what we're talking about in the seventeenth century, almost all of those people who were working on this, doing working on intellectual subjects, so in the seventeenth century, come from. Um, either university backgrounds or like Bacon, for instance, are aristocrats themselves. So there's there's a much broader burst. You know, it has this thing that you know, Habermas talks about, you know, the, the ideal speech situation. You have this talk about everybody can, involved in this discussion, that this is a bourgeois society, if you like. This is the, the blossoming of the bourgeois society. So it extends well beyond um, this, uh, what, um, what Hume calls cells and chapels, you know, that, I mean, Hume's idea, Hume's very idea of saying what we have to have and his preference for the dialogue, for instance, over the treatise was to say, we have to have a language which we can go beyond, you know, the, 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 this, this little elite, um, which of course is associated in the past with the church, which could then dominate our way of thinking. We have to broaden out. And even, you know, as you probably know, I mean, even Kant has this project of, or is involved in this project of what was called popular philosophy and this idea of a popular philosophy. And this is a great thing on the Enlightenment, of course, is published in this thing called the Berliner Monatschrift, which is a popular German, popular in the sense we wouldn't recognize possibly. But nevertheless, it's certainly far broader. It's a far broader in, in sort of range of things. So we're trying to bring in, you, you know, I mean, obviously, from the historical point of view, you're trying to bring in a new class of people who are wealthy, uh, and literate, and of course, and also, you know, um, very, very energetic and concerned with change and learn it in their own way, but their own way isn't that of the previous sort of monastic, you can put it in terms of generation. So I think there's, there is, as all the historians have always pointed out, you know, what you're talking about is a phenomenon which is not just intellectual, mm -hmm. uh, it's also economic and, and, and social. And I don't, there's no space for that in my book, I don't mention that, but I mean, I think it's important to, to I think it would be, if I rewrote it again, I'd probably have to say more about that, because I think it's, it is important that we're dealing with Marx, Marx thought of as the revolution. I mean, the, the, the bourgeois revolution, of course, leads up to the French Revolution. And that without that element, um, this Enlightenment wouldn't have had an audience. It has an audience and a very successful audience. You think that Rousseau's um, Emile, uh, you know, sold so many copies that they had to rent it out by the hour. Um, he didn't make any money from it because in those days, authors didn't make money, didn't have royalties. But the, the popularity of these books goes far beyond anything that was, you know, happened 100 years earlier. 
I don't know what the numbers of copies we're talking about, but certainly, you know, that there was this huge readership suddenly by comparison with what existed. Which is interesting because on a point that I was sort of, well, I'm certainly looking at the moment, there's obviously quite a large middling class in England. So you'd think that England would be, I'm not including Scotland in a Britain idea, but just specifically England and with London, you'd think that with the number of books being published in London because of uh, the bans and everything on the continent, you'd think that that would be the place for enlightenment to be flourishing. And I know commentators like Voltaire and uh, Montesquieu do comment on it. But in terms of our sort of scholarship around England specifically, it's quite limited in terms of saying that there's an enlightenment uniquely taking place in England. Well, Roy Porter thought that was not true. I mean, he thought that this was, this was tried to argue. Mm. Um, and the, I mean, I don't agree with him. I mean, I, mm. don't, I, don't, I don't think he succeeds in making the case quite as forcefully as he wanted to make it. Um, mm. But he had a point. I think there's, uh, if you look precisely, if you look at what people are saying in Europe about England, mm. um, and if you think of what position that, I mean, England starts to occupy a position as, as a central point in the, the European perspective of, you know, um, the intellectual world with, of course, Bacon and Hobbes and Locke and so on. Because Locke is a key figure in this, um, that uh, you know, massive and the treatise on human understanding is something that everybody reads so well everybody everybody in the new classes reads so the, there is this sense that england is a powerhouse of thought and so on and so forth i don't think that's not what you what i think happens is i don't know i mean you could you could say that there's um there's been an attempt there's been a historiography uh I mean, which is in a sense what Porter was trying to argue. There's been a historiography which is trying to put the focus on France all the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, if you read, you know, McIntyre's After Virtue, his claim was it's all German and that France won't do it at all. France is just this frivolous stuff on the side. The real, the real, because he doesn't, he doesn't believe in them, but he recognizes the the force of of um, the Schlegels and the and, and the Kants and, and the Herders and so on. But the the uh, uh, so it's really the perspective you take. We, there tends to be a conception of uh, of France as being the focal center, or fr and French being the. But this partly because f I think French is uh, still in the 18th century thought of as a universal language. Secondly, I think it probably has a lot to do with the encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. You know, the creation of a of a of a, of a massive undertaking. It's an attempt to say this is the text of learning right and it starts off with this incredible introduction which of course where i start my book um where he you know where d'alembert sets out what he thinks enlightenment actually is using that terminology you know? mm. so if you want a description of the project it's that introduction you go to so i think that, that there are various reasons why the historiography has thought about it in these terms you know and why the english have tended to be uh, slightly marginalized. The other thing is, of course, that after the 17th century, most English authors write in English, and English is not a very widely read language. So that you think that, I mean, that Rousseau is reading Hobbes in uh, reading De Kive because it's in Latin. Yeah. yeah. The attack on Hobbes in, in the later part of the 18th century is being made against his Latin works. No one reads Leviathan, or I don't say no one, but I mean, it's, I mean, that's going too far, but no, because that's not the language you write it. Uh, so that, um, you know, there's this, there's this very amusing little anecdote when Bougainville comes back and bringing this Tahitian with him. One of the, um, uh, who then becomes a figure in Diderot's, um, you know, little treatise, but, um, that uh, Voyage de Bougainville. Uh, Bougainville says, you know, I was constantly being asked by members of the aristocracy, by the, you know, the, the literary world, why is it that this Polynesian cannot, hasn't learned, he's been here for a year and he hasn't learned any French. After all, the English can do it in three months. Surely he can do it in a year. So, I mean, the idea that, you know, <laughs> the one thing you have to do, of course, you might say it hasn't changed this day, but the one, certainly in the 18th century, the one thing you had to do 
if you were to go, was to learn French, because French is the common language. You think about all of the, the I mean, you know, you think about the stories of, 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 the, of, of, of all of the, all of them spoke French. Um, or had, at least we don't know how well they spoke, but certainly, I mean, you talk, Hume had these long conversations and spent a lot of time in France, had a long conversation. So it's a way in a sense that if you were an inter English intellectual of any standing, you had to uh, know French. You had to be connected to the French intellectual scene. So, in a way, they're you know, they themselves. In, but you, know, you think of Hume. I mean, Hume, I'm sorry, Smith. Smith translates has great chunks of Rousseau into English to demonstrate that Rousseau has nothing to say, that he's merely a, a rhetorician. I mean, that's the way he's trying to get. It. And they're brilliant translations too. It's so that you have this this conception of French still being, in some sense, the language in which you have to communicate. But you don't write in French, you write in English. So you're writing for an English audience and you're already writing for one in the terms of those. And that I think then remains, but this is merely a historical claim. I think it's not to say that there aren't, um, the, now the great figures of the, of the Scottish Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. so it's the, Scot the Scots who are really the ones who matter. Yeah. And, and, and uh, Smith but are of course, you know, considered to be part of the canon everywhere. After all, in fact, Smith Hume is, I think, you could generally say in the 18th century, say by the end of the 18th century, if you wanted somebody to ask someone in Sweden to nominate the two greatest philosophers of the 18th century, they would say Kant and Hume. Hmm. These are the two major figures that count. And, uh, and very close to that, but you mentioned Voltaire and David Hume as influential figures in the Enlightenment. Yeah. What specific contributions would you say? they made to the advancement of enlightenment ideals and particularly around secular ethics and the science of man well as i say i think that the the one of the uh one of the, the project the sort of core you could define and this was intended to be the title of the book originally you could define the uh the enlightenment as that project making the science of man science de l'homme okay that's the thing that's what it says in the, in the introduction to the, to the encyclopedia Okay, so I'm just nothing new about. It. So did you think about it as that, right? Mm -hmm. And Hume certainly is. Um, it's not the only one to do, because you know, he starts with Locke and so on goes forth. But is certainly trying. That's that's the basic project mm -hmm. um, to make it make us understand human beings in terms which is a scientia, and in the, in the Latin sense, that a, a real form of of knowledge, independent of dogma, independent of you know things that have been handed down to us based upon our observation, based upon our learning and understanding of other cultures and so on and so forth. This is what a, a science of man is. Now, Voltaire is a very different character because Voltaire is working in, a, as I said, in, I mean, you're in a different idiom and a different medium. I mean, this is, this is a, in a way you can think about Voltaire as a highly influential um, figure who, for the most part, his role is, is demolition, right? It's to undo all these écrasé la, la, la femme, you know, smash the infamy, get rid of the prejudice. That's the, that's the sort of, that's the Voltairean model. Hume is less, I mean, obviously, you know, to build, you have to destroy what, you have to take down what was there before. In order to build. But Hume is, and Hume's skepticism, the skeptical part of Hume is part of that demolition job, so to speak. But the, the Hume that we associate with the treatise on human understanding, and also with the various essays on 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 say religion and so on, mm -hmm. are, is a Hume that's trying to rebuild a conception of the human as a as a as a as essentially a scientific understanding, and that that I think is what um, you know that is what is in the, the, the core of this, and also what when when you know Kant makes this famous remark about him waiting, wait, Hume waking him from his dogmatic slumber. It's not just the 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 um, skepticism of Hume, which he could have got from anyone. At uh, least not the skepticism could have got skepticism from anyone. Um, it's the um, it's this conception, um, you know, which goes into um, the writing of the first treatise, the, the first critique. And if you think about it, it's a point that Nora O'Neill made very forcefully that. You know, the first critique starts off with a quotation from Bacon, right? So you have this conception, you know, and it's in commune consultant. We can consult together, right? So it's a, it's a precisely this 
community. So I'm making a critique of pure reason, but I am doing it as a communal activity. And that, that is part of the, the human. That's also, you can see, a continuation of the human project and such. So Voltaire, I think, is, is, is a very, I mean, I've, I mentioned him quite a lot, but I mean, he's a, he's a different sort of character. He's a pragmatist. He's a, sorry, a propagandist. Um, he dispenses, you know, he, he, because of, of this magnificent prose, but also, as I said, because he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a famous figure. He's an extremely important figure who people listen to, you know, uh, much more so than someone like Hume was, after all, just a librarian, basically. As far as the as far as the the haute, monde, the haute bourgeoisie is concerned, Hume is uh, sorry. Voltaire is this great figure who you know lives in this magnificent house on the Swiss border and so on and so forth. And so, has this has the range of, uh, of, of attachments, has this ability to reach audiences that go well beyond, uh, well beyond the salon. I mean, the salon here as well, but it goes well beyond the salon. So that is. Um, Whereas, you know, Hume is, you know, when Hume said about, you know, that the first treatise had fallen, it's still born from the presses. I mean, you know, you can see that this is, this is an important fact. I mean, these, this didn't, I mean, eventually it became a, 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 a something, I wouldn't say a bestseller, but eventually it became very widely read and very widely distributed. But, you know, whereas, but there's the, there's the immediate impact isn't there. The immediate, imp, what you get out of Volta is an immediate impact of the time. And... I think that if you want to choose those two figures, they are very different, and they represent, in a sense, you could say, different aspects of the Enlightenment. Here is the here is the philosopher, uh, the real philosopher, who is going to the heart of the problem, who is asking you to think, and but is also a great stylist. Uh, never never forget that. But that stylist, of course, is also again what we're saying earlier is written in writing in English, not in French. And then on the other hand, you have this great stylist who is not really a great thinker. Um, I, no one called Voltaire that. I mean, he's not a it's by no means trivial, but I mean, it's no means frivolous or anything, but he is this great um, stylist. And that is what carries the word, so to speak, particularly if we're talking about this new bourgeois society that's emerging. Exactly. And someone directly contributing to what I wanted to ask next, which is how did Enlightenment thinkers engage with the border? Sorry, sorry, sorry. Go on, go on, go on. Oh, no, yeah. No. <laughs> um, I was just going to say, how did Enlightenment thinkers engage with the broader cultural scene of their time, particularly in terms of the things we've mentioned already, in terms of art and music? And did these engagements influence their philosophical and intellectual pursuits? Rousseau, I know, composed opera, Voltaire, likewise, uh, was well versed in music. You know, how was it influencing the, the um crucible of ideas at the time well i think that yes i think that we have a i was going to say that all of the major figures you can think of the enlightenment have multiple um strings to their bows so to speak i mean they have multiple multiple they work in multiple different in different fields but then that's not in a sense very unusual if you think about it that all of the their predecessors, in a sense, in the 17th century did. It's it's a stark contrast to the university curricula, people, the theologians and, and the doctors and the jurists and so on who worked in the universities. To use Hobbes again, phrase the schoolmen, right? The scholastics in the true sense of the term. They didn't. I mean, if you were a jurist in the 16th and 17th, you worked on law and that's all you did. And you might, you know, write things on the side if you wanted to, but basically that's what you did. Um, and uh, uh, take someone like Gentile, who's this Italian, you know, renegade, converts to Catholic, converts to um, Protestantism, comes to England, becomes the um, Regis Professor of, uh, of Law in in, in Oxford. Um, you know, this is a, a great intellectual figure. Never wrote anything that wasn't law. I mean, never occurred to him that he had to write something else. So I mean, this is and these he's the most sophisticated of them all. Um, but if you go, then you move forward, you take someone like Locke is writing, you know, basically Locke is writing in, in, in one in a, a restricted idiom, but a much more varied one. Then you then you would then even Hobbes, Hobbes translates after all, um, despite his hatred of, uh, of Aristotle, translates Aristotle's rhetoric into, in, into, into English. He translates Thucydides into English. Magnific He's a magnificent stylist. After all, Locke is not, it should be said. But Hobbes is um, uh, uh, really astonishing, astonishing prose writer. So you you've got this. These these are 
uh, all have this trend. I think what you find in, in the call of the 18th century is it because of this much broader uh, market, much broader intellectual space um, becomes um, uh, much more varied. So you have this this conception that the intellectual, I know that phrase isn't coming into being until much, much later, but this these figures work in different domains at once. Mm -hmm. And um, and this gives their writings a, 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 a far greater diffusion than it would be if, I mean, as I keep saying, this is the point about it. this is a far greater diffusion than it would be if it was simply um, uh, you know, work working within a traditional university framework. You know, if you think of today, if you go back, you think of this constant um, uh, attempt by university presses to reach a larger audience. This is the frame, right? So this is my book. You know, it came out, it was published in the United States by a commercial, published by a, published by the 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 uh, commercial division of Oxford University Press, so called. And the idea was to meet to reach, but you know, compared with what. Compared, I mean, obviously, the comparison is difficult. The, the population size is smaller, the presses are smaller, and so on. But if you think about what someone like a, a Rousseau or a Diderot reaches, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, I mean, I mean, as my publisher used to say in, at Yale when I published Yale, uh, you know, the general public is an academic in another field. And uh, <laughs> this is whereas when someone like Rousseau writes, now he's slightly of some of an exception, you might say Diderot is somewhat of an exception. Um, these are figures who write in very different, different, uh, have this gift uh, for writing in these different modes um, and use them all the time. We don't, I mean, it's difficult to find anybody from the 19th century onwards who, who writes treatises as well as plays, as well as, you know, poetry, as well as music. And in the case of Rousseau, Rousseau's very extreme because he was often, as you know, not only was clearly oriented in music, not only a, 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 a wrote music, but wrote music was extremely popular. And wrote about music in a way that was extremely influential too. Tried, so, yeah. sorry, I was just gonna, and yeah, tried to come up with his own um, uh, musical uh, sort of tablature to, yes. to rival the, the yes. established. No, I mean he's a, he's, a, he's an extraordinary figure in that respect. So, and a wide range, and his French is astonishing, you know. But it's it's simply that. You know, what he says and it's not the matter but <laughs> but the actual language is incredible so you have this sense of you know which which at for a modern a modern indeed contemporary readership you know is always something that's always slightly difficult to actually not difficult not the right word but i mean it's something that has to be i find my students always have to press impress upon them you know, because so many Academics today, university professors, they think that writing is just putting something down on a page, essentially. You know, as long as it makes sense, it doesn't. You know, it's got to make sense. It's got to be coherent. The argument's got to be there, but the way that the argument is stated is irrelevant, and um, it's not a form of literature. Whereas, of course, if you think in the 18th century, philosophy is a form of literature. I mean, it's thought of as a form of literature. So, and you know, you would find people reading it. Um, you know the common the common man. There's a I, I, I mentioned it in the book. There's a there's a there's um, a, a, a popular uh, play, eighteenth eighteenth uh, early eighteenth century uh, French play in which a young woman. It's interesting. It should be a woman, of course, because it's part of this idea that education broadening out beyond the traditional spheres uh, to demonstrate that she is she's pretended to be mad and wanted not to be married to the wrong man to, to claim that she demonstrate that she's actually entirely sane stands up and gives an account an account of the content of Locke's essay on human understanding now you know that the, the no, but what is striking about is not only that this is what she does she doesn't give an account of the latest novel all right and the audience which is a popular audience is supposed to recognize this um you know, that there's a, there's this there's this goes the reaches there. Um, when you think that somebody, even somebody as arcane as Puffendorf, who writes in Latin, who writes this, you know, not very rather tortuous Latin, must be said, but is also also of course a historian. And uh, but if you think that someone like um, in Tristram Shandy, he's referred to as if uh, the readership would know who he was. It doesn't need to be explained who he is. Um, so there's, 
and this is a, a book intended for a popular audience. I'm mean, okay, not a not a very popular audience, maybe. It's not a it's not a piece, not a piece of gutter, gutter writing, but it's but it's nevertheless a popular piece of writing. So I think the the, the spread, the is what that um uh is the public sphere to use Hamamas's term, which of course when he's talking about the Enlightenment, that's also what he's talking about. That is so much broader than anything that existed before in the 17th century, and much broader than anything which exists today. Despite the fact that you know that there are many more books being published, many many more books being published than were in the 18th century, and there are many more copies, and therefore theoretically there are potentially many more readers. But in terms of technology, is there? But readership is not. I think that that this the the dis distribution was much much wider. Than I don't know yeah. if that really answers your question or not, but uh... I think I think so, and I think it leads on to this sort of next point about how those ideas were being communicated beyond the intellectual elite and how these ideas were shaping broader societal attitudes and and the institutions as well. Well, I think I think that we've I've touched on a bit about them. And I think because they find their way into plays, they find their way into popular novels, they find their way into um, uh, you know, treatises which are intended, again, to use Hume's nice phrase, beyond the cells and, and chapels. Um, so beyond religious stones, beyond the universities. Um, that means that you you have a broad intellectual readership, sorry, learned readership, or semi-learned, unlearned, put it this way, no, sorry, I don't want to use the word learning, so that suggests university, but people who are not university professors, who are not um, professionally concerned with these things um so that this is you know they're they're highly intelligent people who've been well trained and so on we don't know exactly who they were because the 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 the, 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 the fact that women now become an, an part of the readership as well is also an insignificant fact something that that, that that hume comments on and so that we have um, this idea that you've got a, a far broader readership than you had before because of the diversity of types. And that has an impact on, I think it has an impact on the way that people come to think about everything from how they ought to be governed to how they ought to live their lives um, to, um, you know, to what kinds of religious beliefs they should have or have not. Um, in the way that the only analogy in previous generations would be the preacher the oral presentation of a set of doctrines but then that again goes back to a, a world in which there was a, a recognized center of autoritas which in this world there is not so if you're dealing with you know when Kant says this is a not as an enlightened century it's a century of enlightenment so it's a century of progress right it's a century of change that these are people who are looking for answers and if you think that the, and eventually, of course, in, in the French way, you can think about that the, the general view, the view taken by some of, of after the event by such conservatives of de Mestre, that the Enlightenment had paved the way for the, uh, for the, uh, for the revolution is often taken by historians as being nonsense, but I don't think it is nonsense at all. I mean, I think that it, you can think about it as a way of saying, it's not that, I mean, it did not, Demes didn't mean that what was happening was that people were taking up these ideas and like turning them into revolutionary principles. I mean, the closest you come to that is the use that uh, the Jacobins made of the contrat social, um, which was true doing that, although they had a very specific reading of, 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 um, of, Rousseau, just as the American revolutions, have a very specific reason, reading of Locke and, and, and Montesquieu. But, but there's a general sense in which, you know, you have a, a now a, a, an audience, which isn't, isn't the, the sans culotte, because the people who make the revolution are not that. They are the provincial lawyers, like Monte Robespierre and so on, right? And those provincial lawyers are the people who are reading Diderot, who are reading... Uh, and who are reading these figures, they're like, okay, they turn against them because they're not they're not ferocious enough, they're not um, revolutionary enough. But the 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 way of the the things that they read as children or as young adults um, led them, I think, created this environment, uh, this public sphere, if you like to use how Musser's phrase, that made it possible for them to come to these much more radical conclusions later on. Mm -hmm. 
And so in that sense, I think someone like Mess is quite right, that he saw this as being, as being the destruction of the last vestiges of what he saw as an, an authoritative structure of order in the world. Um, that then created a vacuum, and that vacuum was filled by the revolutionary yeah. principles of the, of, of the revolution, the principles of the revolution. Um, and Pro uh, Professor Richie Robertson, who's also written on um, the like the enlightenment and the sort of, uh, seeking happiness, I'm interviewing him next week. Um, yeah. And I suppose, similar to what you're saying, that sort of almost in that gap, the sense of fear in the public. Uh, I mean, he refers to the 17th century as kind of like the persecuting society century into the 18th century where there's hope um perhaps that's why the public is so receptive as well because they are desperately looking for something to quell their fear of plague and pestilence of war <laughs> you know <laughs> um yeah um i think yeah i think it's an interesting interesting social analysis at least of why perhaps they're so receptive um but finally yeah, I mean, Mm. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, 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 please, please. Well, that, that, that aspect was true. I just think of, you know, Montesquieu's claim that um, after the death of Louis XIV, then you, the, the world opens up. I mean, it's a particularly French view of it, but I mean, the sense that you've got this to this, you the end of it, roughly speaking, towards the end of the 18th century, there's a, um, there's, there's a new hope because there's, there is this thing that then they call enlightenment take, beginning to take place. In this period that starts in the early 1730s, 1740s, and so on, begins then goes through to the to the end of the century. So, and yes, I think the the the, the I think your I think in his his analysis has a nice feel to it, if you like. I mean, there's a sense historians say it's far too sharp and crude, but I mean, there is a sense that you have this um, you move you're moving towards. Uh, from absolutism to enlightened absolutism, you're moving out of this period of, you know, again, you could look at it from the, the starting with with the, with the creation of the nation state. You're moving uh, moving into the, you of course constantly this this nation state is becoming more and more coherent, more and more emphatic. But it's it's a process by which it's also changing its purposes and identity. And in that sense, this is part of that that shift. Well, exactly. And in terms of shifts, looking at the present day, how do you see the legacy of the Enlightenment continuing to influence contemporary society, particularly in liberal democracies and global institutions like the United Nations? Well, um, this is where the, the book ends. And um, the uh, I think that... Uh, <laughs> That the influence is, I mean, I think first of all, it's an unfinished project. Um, it's still with us. Um, it's still ongoing. Um, it, and if you think about it in terms of um, the bringing together of peoples, the not the destruction of the nations. If you think about the nation state, is a is a, a creation of the nineteenth century, of course not, but it, mm -hmm. it has its roots in sixteen forty eight. Has roots in the seventeenth mm -hmm. century. Um, that this. The, the nation state as it's emerged um, um, in its most caricatural form, let's say Brexit, um, was the most caricatural form. This thing which shut, shuts itself off from the outside world, which sees people as being determined by their place, by their identity, by their, ident their social identity, um, by their, their family liaisons, by their political allegiances and so on, that is something that the Enlightenment has tried to break down. Um, that, of course, is much earlier than this. And to see things as being, yes, these things are important. No one's not denying that. They exist in the world. They have to continue to exist in the world. But um, they're mo but what the Enlightenment has, what did or is doing, because it's still continuing, is to, is to force people to recognize that you don't live alone on this planet um, and you don't live in the, the states in which you live are not just states in which you carry out a series, conduct a series of friendly or not so friendly international relations with other states, but that's where it ends, right? This is a, this is a, a, this is a cosmopolitan order whether we, we already exist in a cosmopolitan order and that cosmopolitan order is becoming more and more uh, cosmopolitan, if you like, more and more international as we move forward in time. So I would say that yes, that the enlightenment, the enlightenment as 
I tried to set out in this book, and as I understood it, as they understood it, I hope, I, I was tried to give an account really of what was, what was it's an intellectual history after all, it's yeah. sort of a piece of um, political dogma, um, understood this cosmopolitanization, this internationalization to be. And that, you know, what are the manifestations of that, which you mentioned, you mentioned the United Nations, um, uh, liberal democracies, global institutions, these have massively increased, not only since the 18th century, but since 1947, 1945, 1946, 1947, 1948, you know, take 1948, which is the Declaration of Human Rights, that is a point, just as a point, just as a date, um, and um, so 1648 to 1948, and you have this, this, this um, huge you know, globalization, not just of institution, not just of the economy, this is all a part of it, but also of human understanding, if you like, this sympathy or pity, as we used to call it, which extended to all human beings, or was believed in that day, has now taken institutional form. Yeah. And if I may um, plug something, you mentioned my last book, which was on, um, indeed, on the European Union and the attempt to create a European Union as it was it was partly as a response to the Brexit crisis, of course, but um, which was the last published one in English, but there's one that came out up after that in Italian, uh, which is going to be published in September by Polity Press called Beyond States. Mm -hmm. And that tries to take this story precisely down, not just to today, but in some, some projected hypothesis into the future. Fantastic. Well, yeah, I will certainly be reading. I've got your paperback edition here of the Enlightenment While It Still Matters, um, which I've been utilising. And yeah, it's just leads me to say thank you so much for joining us, Professor Anthony Pagden, and for sharing so much with us. Thank you very much for having me.